we're going to be looking at Zinger. Now, um, I'm going to preface this by saying that I've been excited about Zinger's project for I don't know how many years now. I'm going to count on you to bring me back to Earth. So uh, please do that. I'll try so, my best. Let's get started. What is Zinger? Zinger is founded by this um, very enthusiastic CEO with a vision of redoing... With the last name Zinger. With the last name Zinger. Of redoing how we approach car manufacturing. He has this idea that we've been like stuck in the past. Technologies have evolved. Why hasn't car manufacturing? And what he's really harping on is 3D printing. Okay. So how, how do you prove to people that there is a great path forward with 3D printing? Well why don't you just go after the highest end of the market, which is hypercars, and build the best one out there using well, your technology? Th- that's a, that's a well-documented approach, right? Um, Absolutely. I, I think about Tesla. They started like making their Roadster first mm-hmm. before they made any of their other consumer products. Uh, also, Remac, they started by Love making Remac. hypercars and then trickled down into helping their technology become a part of, you know, some of the biggest manufacturers in the world, Volkswagen, Hyundai, and they partner with Camel, like one of the biggest battery manufacturers in the world. So it's, uh, it's not unheard of to start at the bot or start at the top and then let your work trickle, th- tr- trickle down to the bottom. So what are they doing with this 3d printed supercar? I'm excited to hear the stats, you know, but you and I are both car guys, so we'll have to check ourselves so we don't you know, go off the rails with this one. I got you, man. Um, so here's the thing. I'm going to start off with the chassis. That's the part that I, I love the most. Okay. Their approach is to create these things called nodes. And the way, the way they go about it, these are like main structural components that hold the frame together. They're made out of this aluminum alloy that they've developed themselves. And the design, like, you know, the, the, the design engineer gives the basic layout, but it's actually the final thing is made by AI via generative design. We've covered it in the past. The TLDR of it is you make this like general shape of what you want the end product to be. Then you start applying the forces that are going to be acting on it. And whatever software you're using starts doing analysis and iterative design over and over and over again until it finds the best shape possible for the manufacturing approach that you want to use and the loads that you want to use. So knowing that they want to use carbon fiber tubes, knowing that they want to use their 3D printed nodes, and knowing that they want to minimize weight, I'm sure, to make sure that this thing is, you know, super high performance um and use the, le- the least amount of material possible to make it. there's this, no way this generative design software tells them this is the exact shape you need to create to make your body structure okay in this car exactly and because they're 3d printing the nodes they can actually do whatever geometry they want they're not limited to traditional manufacturing methods exactly so they make their design they and by the way to do a lot of this they actually had to come up with tools that was not available in the industry before so they, they've built this stuff from the ground up. And like, like you mentioned, with the chassis, you have all these nodes. They connect them together with carbon fiber tubes, and that's it. So I, I, I wanted to talk to you about this specifically because you worked at Tesla, and you know what it takes to make a chassis. I think you actually worked on the materials team like two years ago at this point, right? Yeah. It's to come up with like uh, – it's they usually do casting, right, for like bigger metal pieces. Yeah. To come up with a new cast design, to come up with the tooling and everything, it's very, very expensive. And if you're a small car manufacturer, you're probably not going to be able to afford that unless you have big, big pockets supporting you. Yeah, well, I mean, look at, you can look it up, Tesla's GigaCast. That is what their effort to cast the underbody of some of their cars using an aluminum alloy. Um, and they ended up, I think, procuring the largest... Uh, die casting machines in the world to be able to achieve that. So if you're an upstart company like Zinger, how do you do this? Or if you want to change the geometry or if you want to make it, you know, specially designed to a certain use case or load case, 3D printing makes a lot of sense. So I'm excited that they're doing this. Um, My question is, are they, so you said they developed their own alloy for 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Are they just using that one everywhere in the body? Because Another thing I'm drawing from, you know, the car industry, the auto industry, is you use a lot of different materials for mm-hmm. different use cases. Maybe you need to focus on temperature. Maybe you need to focus on weight. What are the other materials they're using, if any, or are they just using their one? That, that's actually a good point. So, no, they are using three 3D printed materials that I'm aware of. Um, one of them is the aluminum alloy, but they're also using 3D printed titanium and Inconel. Okay. So, they, they are aware of, like, 
this needs to be a process that isn't uh, one trick pony, right? We need to do different metals because that's what the operational requirements are. Well, and to me that uh, is a lot more impressive, really like a lot more legit if their printers can also handle printing three different types of metals. Absolutely. But now I want to get to the fun parts because that's what we came here for. Yeah. Let's talk about the stats. This thing weighs about 1,165 kilograms for the base model. You got 1,174 horsepower. Holy cow. Coming from a V8 in the back and two electric motors for the two wheels up front. It has a one-to-one seating position. So exactly like a fighter jet, you have the driver up front and the passenger right behind you. The first in the industry if... Well, they're hitting manufacturing this year, but no one's done I'm looking at this thing. It looks like a fighter jet. It, it, it looks absolutely insane. And it actually um, beat the lap record for the McLaren Senna. Ah, oh, frick. I forgot what... Uh, Was that Laguna Seca? Laguna Seca, yes. Yes. It beat it back in August. Wow. Dude, this thing is absolutely insane. And, and you know what? The thing that makes me kind of like shocked, but also very proud... It's American. Like, yeah. America usually isn't known for the insane supercars. Like, yeah, we have SSC. You know, we have Hennessy. There's, there's efforts being made. But this thing is like, it, it, I would expect it to come out of like Germany or Italy or somewhere like that. But no, it is American made. And it is impressive cool. on the engineering front, the design front. And apparently, if, if you look at like the people that actually drove it, the driving experience is quite exhilarating as well. Well, and one thing for us is, 3D printing nerds as well. We can be excited that 3D printing is a core technology mm-hmm. in their stack of how they're making this as well. Absolutely. And you know what? The, the big question is, well, now you made the supercar. So what now? That's it. That's what the CEO wanted to prove is that we can do something amazing. By the way, the entire thing is assembled by autonomous robots within, uh, I think, 125 days from start to finish. So it doesn't scale super well if you want to start doing Fords or Toyotas with it right now, but they proved the concept. And now, just like Remock did, I think their plan is to get other manufacturers excited about this and be like, hey, we have these services. Let's start working together to revolutionize this industry that's been stuck back in the 20th century. Well, hey, that's really exciting to me. And I'm, you know, it's always, it it always gets me hyped up when I see 3D printing being used in an industry application other than just prototyping, because there are instances where 3D printing can be used in production. And that's exciting to me. Me too, friend.